Hello and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Today we will be hearing about Intel RealSense from Joel Hagberg, Head of Product Management and Marketing for their Computer Vision product lines. At Intel RealSense, they've developed a series of camera products which allow robots to leverage off-the-shelf computer vision technology. With Intel's RealSense technology, robots can generate three-dimensional videos, extract skeletal movement as people walk, detect gestures and objects, and more. Joel talks to our interviewer Abate about the value of leveraging tightly integrated hardware and software products for startups and established companies alike, particularly to enable them to hit the ground running. He also discusses the integration of machine learning into Intel RealSense products. Hello. Welcome to RoboHub. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, my name is Joel Hagberg. I lead the marketing, product management, and customer support teams at Intel RealSense. I've been here about three years. Uh, prior to that, did a lot of consulting in uh, the mobile payment space and some memory acceleration, and also spent uh, you know, 20 plus years in high tech uh, product management marketing for storage devices, uh, flash memory, uh, hard disk drives and a lot of other things. Uh, and many building blocks are used in, in robotics uh, today. And what brought you to uh, the RealSense team at Intel? Well, I was uh, looking, I, actually I was doing some consulting, getting some uh, flash advanced um, uh, Apache Pass DIMMs from, from Intel for an AI accelerator project and was talking to their uh, VP of sales. And he said, you know, we're really looking for somebody to come help with product management and marketing for uh, some emerging computer vision uh, products. Would you be interested in talking to us? And as a consultant at the time, I said, sure, I'll come in and talk. And as I uh, met with RealSense, I realized, you know, this technology uh, in RealSense has been in this business, you know, at the time it was like eight years, uh, doing some really fantastic things with, uh, computer vision, both uh, kind of on a bunch of different areas. Uh, at the time, coded lights and stereo products and was looking to get into LiDAR. And I just felt like it's that kind of a nascent industry that's getting ready to, you know, kind of become ubiquitous and felt it was really a, a good time to get in and learn, you know, and, and if you look at the use cases, robotics is the largest use case for this. And I felt like, well, hey, robotics is an area that's going to see explosive growth, computer vision, is going to see explosive growth, autom- you know, assisted driving, ADAS, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles and robots and and, and cars is, is an area where we're I think is going to see tremendous growth. So that's really what got me excited to join. And it's kind of kind of like a startup within Intel. It's part of the emerging growth and incubation group. So it's a, we have an incubator. We pull in a lot of other you know technologies. So you'll see uh, Intel does a lot of stuff with um, with uh, computer vision, whether it's LIDAR, radar, and, and uh, the stereo vision that we're, we'll be talking about today. Uh, but uh, we, you know, there's a whole you know, team of, at Mobileye that's doing stuff for, for vehicles. So we've got a, uh, a pretty broad, you know, kind of R&D team doing research. Our CTO has an extensive experience in, in computer vision. So it's, it's just felt like a, a very exciting team to join. And coming in, it is like a startup within this, you know, the big umbrella of Intel but uh, doing a lot of uh, very kind of moving very fast and, and, and making uh, you know, uh, changes quickly. So that's one of the things that really appealed to me about uh, the Intel RealSense team. Yeah. Can you walk us through a couple of the products that are offered by RealSense? Sure. If you look at, at, at RealSense, uh, as, as we you know, look at the kind of the, the use case of products, there was a a series of products that were used uh, in coded light that were installed in PCs, used in very short range, indoor applications. And uh, yeah, so if, if you look at the last 11 years, we've shipped over 2 million products into the market. And coded light was kind of the, that early phase. Probably in 2018, the stereo products were launched. And mm-hmm. I joined in 18 and the stereo products, the D400 family that we have today, uh, was starting to, you know, kind of see some uh, growth in the, uh, both in that we have a, an e-commerce site. So we were seeing direct touch with customers, you know, really startups working on new projects. We're able to source directly from our website. And then we, we sell through distribution. So a lot of specialty distributors that are in the supplying the robotics, manufacturing, uh, digital signage markets were 
promoting our products. So uh, we have a, a, a D400 family. We have a D415 and D435 at the time, which were our, our volume products. Uh, the you know, D415 has a uh, kind of a, of a shorter range with a rolling shutter. And then the D435 has a, 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 a kind of a, they're both in the three meter range, but just seems like a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit further range with the D430. Uh, five and it has uh, a, a rolling shutter and that that is the product that's most widely adopted in the robotic space and if you look at the way intel you know goes to market we sell a peripheral which is plug and play you can start you know testing immediately or you could take uh if you want to look at kind of a tighter integration you can buy a module you can buy an ac card integrate it actually into your design and uh, and able to reduce cost a bit or you know change the look and feel of the product more to your to the specific oems uh you know platform but those are the 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 volume products that we launched um in 2018 which have been really uh, widely adopted into the into the robotic space and this is a series of stereo vision cameras that use a light pattern that they emit onto the scene and then that that light pattern it's an ir light correct yeah, well, if you look at it, the stereo cameras themselves work in bright sunlight to 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 dark. So we do just take the you know natural sunlight images in through the stereo imagers, and those are able to you know take in and create depth information outside of you know uh, needing an illuminator or projector to uh, to to light up a scene. So we do have we do project a, a stereo a pattern which the stereo uh, cameras used in low light conditions or, or, or no light conditions. So we are able to use IR. Uh, so if you look at it, we have kind of the, the data comes in through the, uh, the, the, um, the stereo sensors. We have both, uh, RGB, IR, we have the, uh, projector illuminators, which uh, do light up the scene and project a pattern. So as you indicated is is the ability to, to see texture, to see things using those, uh, that, that pattern is projected onto a scene. Mm-hmm. And I've actually used the Intel uh, RealSense D435i before. Mm-hmm. And one of the amazing things about it, you just buy a piece of hardware, connects via USB, very simple to set up. And um, that, like, that being able to connect something by USB and be super simple, how has that affected the design of the products that you've built? Yeah, I think it, it, actually what you hit on is one of the kind of the, the, the cornerstones of the Intel approach, which is let's make it very easy to get up and started. So you're whether you're, you know, a, a researcher at a university, whether you're a student in high school, you can plug and play and, and, and start working immediately. And we have, you know, CTOs of, um, of, of startups to, to major corporations that like that they can just buy a camera plug it in and start testing immediately. And one of the things, and as I talked to uh, the, the, the design team that they felt was really critical was to have an open source community and an open source SDK. So we built the, the SDK 2.0 that we launched, that we support for our, our D400 family. Actually, that uh, SDK applies to all of our cameras. So if you buy the, for example, your you know D435 that you referenced, plug and play you can use code examples from that intel provides on our github site or you can use code examples from the community to get immediately up and going you know you might want to do you know simultaneous slam and or visual slam with uh, uh, some algorithms that are available on the site or you may want to look at uh, you know collision avoidance with your robot you know there's things there or your you're, you have an articulated arm. You want to look at you know, what code examples are on there for object detection. And so we built this, uh, the SDK with the thought, hey, let's make it open to the uh, community to allow them to uh, learn from each other, to provide, you know, kind of support uh, as a broad sense to, to get up and going quicker. And that's one of the, the thoughts in the design was let's make it USB plug and play as a peripheral. Now we do see that once uh, a company has uh, adopted it, tested it and deployed it, uh, depending upon the use case, there are people that like to integrate it into their device um, and for some, uh, you know, uh, to reduce cost and to 
to uh, to make it look and feel like you know just a single OEM device with the camera embedded in it. Uh, but in, in the case of, of some of the largest robotics companies we we have deploying it, we'll see them still use the peripheral because it's calibrated, it plugs in, and it just works from from the get go. And they can they look at it and say, "Hey, Intel, you're the computer vision expert. We're a robotics expert. We're going to focus on the robotics operating system, the robotics, uh, you know." Uh, you know, kind of the, the use case for this particular robot and we'll let you worry about you know, giving me the data so I can make decisions. And so plug and play of the peripheral, we're finding even some very large robotic manufacturers are using the peripheral in their design. But we've got others that are saying, hey, we're going to a high volume robot for food delivery and, you know, we're going to be, you know, going outdoors and we want to embed, you know, the module inside of a, an IP67 rated you know, camera for out in the rain. And and so we have customers that are uh, integrating the product into their own device in a robot, you know, the, in the use case of the of a delivery robot for, you know, outdoor food delivery or even delivery inside of a restaurant or delivery in a hospital. They're integrating the module into their design in, in multiple spots. That way they're deploying uh, they're they're able to see you know multiple cameras inside of the design and integrate it into their you know their base uh, you know, robot platform. Yeah, and I imagine that designing this so that it can run off of USB and then working within the power constraints of uh, what the USB cable can mm -hmm. output and also what the uh, computer and whatever is powering it can actually give to over that USB cable has forced you guys to. Uh, make the design very specialized to work off True. of USB. Have there been any trade-offs that you make and that maybe as you see for some of these companies that are trying to integrate this into a single cohesive um, product that doesn't have these limitations? Yeah, I think if you look at it from, from a design philosophy, Intel wanted to, to build a very high performance uh, computer depth camera that <clears throat> would give you very good quality depth with a uh, an, an ASIC that does all the calculations at the edge. So basically you're able to do all that work inside the camera and then transfer the data. And, and we, we have a wide range of frame rates and um, uh, resolutions available. So you can really can you kind of tune what you receive at the uh, system level uh, based on your, your requirements. So so using the USB bandwidth, obviously, you know, going to USB, there's other, you know, bandwidths. You do some trade-offs, like for Ethernet, you may have a, a trade-off in resolution. So we do have customers that that buy our, our cameras and integrate them into an Ethernet enclosure for some industrial applications. And uh, we, we do see that, but there's some trade-offs on resolution. So it really is, you know, you look at the end user or the robot manufacturer We'll look at it and say, well, what do I need from the scene? How much um, information do I need for object recognition? How much uh, detail do I need for, uh, you know, scanning a room and building, you know, a kind of a 3D map of this environment uh, or to do visual slam? What kind of amount of data do I need? What kind of frame rate? What kind of resolution do I need uh, to, to build this 3D model? So there, so we've, we've purposely built it with a with that kind of flexibility to uh, you know dial up the frame rate or down, or adjust the resolution up or down. And by keeping it within that USB power mode, we're able to to do all that at the edge and still keep it a very low power. You know, 150, 300 milliwatts. I mean, you're you're looking at a very low power device. And because we're doing the processing within that ASIC. You don't really need a, a, a very high-end graphics processor at the system level to do that work. And I think you'll, you'll look at some other solutions in the market where you're trying to pull data in, you're, you're, having, you're taxing your system with a very you know, high-end processor or graphics engine to do that calculation that we're actually doing within the camera. Mm -hmm. And so RealSense has done a really excellent job at integrating hardware and software and then outputting that over a common format. Um, now, how does machine learning and AI fit into this story at RealSense? Yeah, I think one of the things that obviously, as we talk to our partners, uh, there's a lot of work uh, in AI inference engines and, and machine learning happening within 
the industry uh, happening within Intel. And uh, with with our cameras, the, the the ability to do all of this very fast processing at the edge really en enables the, the the remote system to make inference and decisions on the fly because you're getting this data processing at, at the edge. So it does lend itself to a wide range of um, AI applications and machine learning where you know the robot can course correct whether it's a drone flying making judgments you know on on at a high speed or it's you know trying to determine where to land it can you know use its depth uh information to make a decision on you know safe places to land or how to approach or how to avoid an obstacle and uh so those things are happening but we also see uh, a lot of uh, work with um, uh, companies that are doing this uh, running algorithms for object detection and in the robotic space you know if you look at e-commerce there's a significant because of the you know significant growth especially with covid of you know e-commerce and ordering at home and having stuff delivered to your home office uh, there's been a significant push at how do we improve the um the performance of uh, robotic arms for pick and place and i think part of that is enable the machine to have uh, the ability to make a decision based on what's in a bin. Okay, uh, knowing machine learning and training, uh, there's training algorithms, you know, have built over, you know, repetitive pattern, repetitive uh, use and, uh, and, and, and um, uh, kind of uh, app or data sets that, that may have been purchased or trained within one of our, our partners that can allow a pick and place robot to make better decisions. And then, you know, we have companies like, uh, you know, right hand robotics that are, are looking at how can we use a labor multiplier and be able to use, you know, one person to run multiple robotic arms. And, and as you improve your training algorithms, you then also improve the efficiency of these robotic arms to make decisions, which then can uh, discern objects in a bin, recognize locations and look at, how best to pack, uh, you know, uh, something for shipment. And that would allow an operator to, you know, kind of supervise multiple screens. And, and if there's a, a problem, it says, okay, I see this robotic arm is having an issue with this new object that's coming into test. Well, we need to do some more training on that particular object. So it's, it allows the operator to then identify things that are troublesome for a robotic arm to make a decision and then how to approach it, how to, how to pick something up, how to you know, discern one object from the other. It, it's something that machine learning, I think comes definitely into play. And then I think the robotic arms and just the, you know, kind of the escalation of uh, e-commerce demand has really driven, how do we improve efficiency in this machine learning algorithms to, to really train the arm to, to be more uh, efficient and, and, to, and deliver, you know, improved efficiency throughout the supply chain. And that's one of the things that I think when we when we started you know, working on some of these applications, we saw there's a rippling effect. Okay, if you can improve efficiency at the pick and play space, well, all of a sudden, then you need to improve efficiency on moving those you know full boxes out with robots. And now your AMR robots become a, a, you know, a, 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 a much um, uh, more focused you know effort on how do we, okay, how do we improve the AMR move away from, you know, uh, liberal tags or, uh, or guided lines and, and guided vehicles to an autonomous vehicles that can actually move faster and make decisions, uh, and, and, you know, more safely how to stop quickly if, you know, some, some person or some other object comes into, you know, uh, an area where they, they felt they could move safely. So, so I think machine learning, probably a long winded answer to your question. I think we see it kind of bubbling up in certain use cases where, hey, these training algorithms are really delivering value to the, uh, not only to the robotics manufacturer, but to the end customer who ultimately is, is saying, hey, here's the ROI I'm getting by investing in these robots. Mm -hmm. So the RealSense product line is, it's great for being able to tag, you've got your depth data on top of the video data, sure. and you can use that to train and tag these ML algorithms. Are you guys yeah. also, um, developing these algorithms in-house and then making them say publicly available 
for somebody who's prototyping and they want their depth camera, but they also want to run some standard um, algorithms on it, object detection, facial recognition, um, without having to rebuild the wheel or um, go through um, a lot of documentation. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the things, one of the challenging things in the industry is that data sets. And, and the reality is that we buy data sets ourselves to help train algorithms for certain applications. And one of the challenges is these are not something we can pass on publicly, right? So we, we acquire a data set, we use it in, in an algorithm. And for example, we've launched uh, at the beginning of this year, a facial authentication camera. Well, part of the last few years of work has been, we, we had, uh, we saw an, uh, an increased use of our standard, actually the D415, which is the um, uh, little lower cost uh, camera than, than the D, D435. That product comes in a $149 list versus the $179 list of the D435. That camera in its, its module form, again, for further cost reduction, and with its rolling shutter, it has a very good performance at, at that short range. We found it to be uh, starting to see significant uptick in use in facial authentication applications with third-party FA software. Well, Intel RealSense at the time had already been working on uh, facial authentication software for a customer who is looking to use our you know, cameras in uh, residential door locks. So we started partnering with them and, and realized, okay, for us to really build this out, we really need to, to, to you know, kind of build uh, data sets and, you know, buying data sets and, you know, testing, you know, a wide range of ethnicities and, you know, kind of, um, in our, and, and capturing data in all, you know, low light, no light, you know, bright lights, you know, backlight conditions it is a pretty daunting task. So, over a few years, we've invested a lot of time data collection ourselves, you know, with tens of thousands of, you know, individuals across the world of different ethnicities to build an algorithm into our uh, facial authentication camera. So at the beginning of, you know, 2021, we launched the uh, into your real sense ID, which is a um, on device uh, facial authentication camera with an algorithm built into the, the product. So in that case, we've invested a lot of time and effort to build a product which is uh, very, very high performance, uh, very low cost, low power, but also has significant anti-spoofing. And part of the anti-spoofing is building that data set. And it is really a, a, a core IP uh, to our device, that data set. So, so it's something that you'll find most companies that are, are doing the, the, object recognition or facial authentication, they're not putting out those data sets, you know, for the public because there is IP and, and lots of uh, time and money invested to build that data set. So I think it's, it's something I think you'll see. There's a lot of universities out there that have uh, data sets available for object recognition. Again, you end up buying it or getting access to it. But one of the stipulations is if you're using it to train your system, is you're not going to monetize that set or you're not going to, you know, you really need to go back to those universities and, and look for, you know, what's possible for, you know, a startup or a, uh, you know, an individual researcher, what data sets are available, you know, from the uh, eat.edu community that might enable you to do some, some preliminary work. But I think uh, for us, uh, you know, today we have a lot of partners that are doing object recognition very uh, with our cameras and their one of their core IPs is the data set they built, you know, that allows them to improve and tune that object recognition. Mm -hmm. So the algorithms, um, that are the result of the ML can be run and given to the consumer, but access to that data set, that's the, the gold mine that's kept separate. Yeah. I think if you, if you, if we look at our partners that are doing object recognition and, and some of the other, um, uh, uh, applications they they are you know training the device with their data set and and they don't you know share that publicly so i think it's 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 really one of those things where uh, i think as we look forward we've done some work with robots uh in warehouses for inventory management um and uh actually dimensional weight for um, measurement for logistics and billing and shipping 
And in that instance, you know, robot can, a robot can go along, scan a shelf and say, okay, this SKU number, you know, one, two, three is this size based on that pallet. There's 23, you know, boxes in that. So, so a robot can come do inventory with that, but we've had to train it with an algorithm. So when we go to a, to a warehouse partner, we're actually building a data set unique to them. So we're in, in the warehouse where we deployed these for say incoming inspection, any new SKU comes in, it's scanned. We have a, you know, a mounted, we can have a desk mounted device, which, or, or a table mounted device, which is scanning, you know, individual packages. We can have a cage scanning. Uh, and we actually, we use, we have a LIDAR camera, which has very good edge fidelity that's been used in this space, our L515 LIDAR product. We have released a, a dimensional weight software. And now this dimensional weight software is available on our website as a trial. So people can pick it up and look at it and say, okay, how do I do, you know, uh, you know, volumetric billing? Well, you can use this to a very, very quick snapshot, put a, um, a uh, package on a, on a table and use our camera to, to take a quick look at it and you know, give you the volume for, for that legal for trade billing. And so in that case, you know, we're able to, to recognize the you know, size and shape of a SKU and we can build a database of a particular customer for their warehouse of so all of the SKUs they, they maintain, then mm -hmm. they in turn can use that, you know, use, take that algorithm uh, that's been trained around their unique SKUs and have a robot now do inventory, do you know, reordering, do uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, biometric billing as things are going out to be loaded on a truck. So there's a lot of interesting use cases, but in a sense, one of the things that uh, we're enabling with this dimensional weight software is the customer to build their own uh, kind of data set that of their device, of their own unique you know, products that allows them to to move forward with uh, a wide range of applications, and and we actually see you know customers coming and saying, okay, this is this is great, and now I want to do I'm moving a lot of things over conveyor belts. Can you look at that? So we have a lot of you know creative um, ideas coming out of the the initial dimensional weight billing system. Now it's inventory control system, but it, it is in in a sense you know building a, a, a data set around uh, a unique, you know, customer, uh, you know, kind of um, environment. And so we do see our cameras being used in that case. And and for us, it's, we're enabling the customer to, to build that data set over time by capturing information, use of our cameras. Yeah. So RealSense has been immensely impactful for the market of 3D reconstruction, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it still feels like a field that has a lot of room to grow and become more commonplace in product offerings um, by sure. various companies. Mm -hmm. um, what would you, how would you describe the current state of this market and where it will grow to? Yeah, I think we, we see that there's a, there's a number of, you know, partners of eyes like, like dot products that are do, building some uh, interesting handheld devices. We've got other companies that are, uh, you know, doing, uh, kind of 3D reconstruction of inspection. So they might go into a, um, uh, um, an environment after an earthquake and do inspections of uh, structures like bridges and, and uh, overpasses and look for structural cracks in concrete. And they're doing a very detailed 3D scan. And uh, today, a lot of it is using our stereo cameras, which work very well indoors and out. Uh, we do see others doing the, the, the current LIDAR offering. The L515 is, like I said, is very good for that edge fidelity in the billing. It's also very good at scanning from, from distance. But today that is uh, that uh, L515 is an indoor only product. So if you're doing uh, scene recon you know, reconstruction indoors of a, of, uh, a house or an, an, an indoor environment, LIDAR works really well. And, and I guess, again, we are looking at the future. How do we expand, you know, the, the use of that LiDAR beyond? Because if you look at, again, there's a lot of uh, very high performance outdoor LiDAR, which is very expensive, you know, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And we're talking about a $349 LiDAR device, which is, uh, gives you excellent depth data, you know, in that, you know, you know forward uh, kind of nine meter range. And um, so, yeah, re the reconstruction you're talking about, we see, you know, construction, um, uh, kind of uh, 
home uh, real estate kind of applications. We actually have some police using it for crime scene reconstruction. Uh, so we see see these things coming, and we have uh, uh, a, a company using it for ships for inspection of uh, you know kind of structural inspection and you know just even just maintenance. You know, is, is this area been painted? You know, is the is there any cracking or peeling of paint as they scan a as they walk through uh, with a handheld uh, scanner? Uh, the structure of a ship or an oil field. You're looking for, you know, potential maintenance hazards on pipes and, and things. So, so we've got companies looking at doing uh, work with drones for field inspection, uh, scanning with tablets or robots for sites. And I, I think it's as you indicated, it's kind of an it's an emerging space, um, and we see you know, a, a, a number of customers building these, these handheld or robot mounted uh, devices for the application. But I do think it's at, it's at, at it's an, still an early stage in, in that. We, we, if you look at our use cases, you know, robotics is by far the dominant use case. I think if you step down, facial authentication is, is, an, is another very large use case for us. We see, you know, deployed in point of sale, ATM systems around the world. People are starting to use facial authentication, uh, DORA, uh, Kind of corporate access control instead of the you know the badges that you badge in. You're now people are scanning faces as they walk to doors, and we see it deployed in residential home locks. And we've already launched some residential home locks with partners in China. We do see them coming to you know the rest of the world in, over time uh, for facial authentication. So that's kind of the second big bucket of use case. And then um, next is, is scanning. So the the scanning you're talking about, you know, we, we do see you know body scanning, room scanning. Uh, you know, inspection, uh, you know, and, and manu- uh, construction kind of scanning. Uh, we've got customers uh, using it to scan a body into avatars for, for gaming. Uh, we see health clubs uh, scanning, you know, doing a complete, you know, 360 scan of a person to look at, you know, how their inches are reducing over the course of their workout or how their muscles are expanding. So those are areas where, where scanning is starting to be used. And we also see recognition interaction as another, you know, large use case for us. And, and that, I think that one, when you look at scanning, I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's emerging. I think recognition interaction is, is a bigger space for us today because we see it in um, uh, educational displays, interactive displays where K through 12, you know, education where, especially in the, you know, K through uh, eight, uh, you know, schools around the world where they put a, a, a digital sign up, put one of our cameras on top. There's a number of companies doing these educational programs where kids really have interactive play to learn language or math uh, with, uh, you know, using gesture recognition with that digital sign. Uh, also with the recent, um, COVID-19 kind of concerns about transfer of virus. Uh, Touchscreens have gotten a lot of concern over from a number of our customers. So using our cameras to kind of put a, a virtual you know, screen in front of a touchscreen so you can then get close but not touch it and still have that, that same user interaction of a touchscreen and you get close, maybe a green dot pops up and it, it, it acknowledges you just selected that you know, particular fast food item, we see, we're starting to see those start to be deployed. So I think recognition interaction is, is an area where it's, it's kind of a broad area because it's those interactions with digital signs, interactive with kiosks or displays, but also uh, retail analytics is a big growth area where people are mounting cameras in the ceiling just to track, uh, you know, customer flow or customer movement through a department store. To just to, to understand you know how they should lay things out or we also have the uh, kind of uh, the pay as you go you know the cashierless store where a lot of our cameras are mounted in the ceiling and customers are able to you know walk through grab an item and the camera depth camera can know hey that was you know shelf number three and other cameras can triangulate and say yes that's the item that was picked and and charge you as you, as you go out the door so we see you know that retail analytics uh, the point is you know kind of that the the the, uh, the facial authentication ro- robotics of course is still the biggest growth you know spot for us and the biggest you know use case for our products but we see these other ones starting to to emerge and I think the the, the question you asked about machine learning I think there's definitely 
a, a number of customers who are looking at how can we get more intelligence at the edge and how can we do more decision making at the edge. And that may come with, you know, surveillance cameras trying to discern, is that a human being or an animal that's walking across that, you know, yard? Or is it in a, in a warehouse? Is this, you know, robot that's moving along as a security guard make a decision? Is there any, you know, other movement in the area that's not typical? Is there a person, you know, a human being, you know, entered the environment where they, we don't expect one. So having a depth camera that can make a decision at the edge and send an alert up rather than 24 hour video feed of everything. Well, here's the one moment that we see something out of the ordinary, make a decision and send that up. So adding more intelligence to the edge, I think is something that you'll see coming. And I, I think, you know, your machine learning question, I think is really, how does the how do we put more intelligence to the edge is something we're still investigating as, 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 a, as an industry. And I think you'll see, you know, advances coming along, along the way there. Awesome. And a last question for you. Sure. What's top of mind for you at RealSense? I think when we, at RealSense, obviously uh, the way we've designed uh, the cameras is that, you know, we're, we're going to ensure that it's future proof. So if you build, you know, something around one of our cameras and you decide, yeah, I really need to go longer range. I really, you know, need to move from stereo to LIDAR for this application. The development work you've done is is future proof that it's going to plug and play with the next camera. And that's so for us, as we look to the next generation, uh, you know, our, this year we launched, uh, you know, the, um, the facial authentication, kind of an extension of use of depth to to provide anti-spoofing in that facial authentication, facial authentication space. We've also launched a touchless control software. So we're looking at how do we augment and enhance the, the offerings with software and, and other maybe algorithms that can enable our, our partners to build, you know, unique solutions on top of, but we're also have, have, ex, have extended the, 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 the camera's range. We introduced a D four, five, five, which gives you, Kind of instead of a three meter range, you're now at a six meter range. And so we're continuing to look at how do we improve the performance at distance? How can we make, you know, let your robot move faster? The further you can see, the faster you can make a decision on when you need to stop. So maybe you can move a little faster and if, you, if you've got that little bit longer range. So I think we're, we're continuing, you know, to look uh, and to work with our customers on their particular new concerns, whether they're looking at, alternative interfaces, longer range, or um, other other things that they can think of. Uh, you know, for example, calibration has been an issue with stereo cameras over the years. So Intel worked on a, you know, self calibration. So we have health check that our cameras can do on their own. So the camera can calibrate itself, you know, re, re, so we've given over time as we work with our customers, we see, hey, what challenges are you having? And how can Intel help you, you know, uh, you know, ease your support requirements uh, on the use of depth cameras. And so that's really a goal for us is not only to extend the portfolio, but how do we improve the current, you know, cameras to ensure it's easier for the robotics customers to be able to uh, adopt our solution and, uh, and improve the performance of their end device, which we want to be the computer vision experts to, to enable that, that customer to be the robotics expert. Awesome. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. Yeah, Bhatia, it was definitely uh, appreciate the, the chance to get here and, and uh, join the podcast. And I look forward to, uh, to watching many more uh, episodes of your podcast in the future. Thank you very much. See ya. Okay. Thank you. Take care. We hope you enjoyed listening to Joel Hagberg discuss the latest updates from Intel RealSense. There's plenty more to discover at robohub.org forward slash podcast including information about how you can become a patron for RoboHub. As a community-sponsored podcast, we are run by a team of volunteers from around the globe, and we rely on small donations from listeners like yourself to help us keep going. So check out how you can get involved and become a supporter, patron, or volunteer at robohub.org forward slash podcast. Our next episode will air in two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye.